everyone for attending the Kern Council of Government 27th Annual Regional Awards of Merit Ceremony. My name is Cheryl Wegman, and I am Kern Cog's Chairman for 2018. I'm excited to have my friend and co-director Jennifer Wood as my assistant MC for tonight's ceremony. Tonight we honor individuals and organizations that have demonstrated leadership and dedication and who have shown a commitment to making their local communities and the entire region of Kern County a better place to live and work. No more than ever, Kern Cog's mission is crucial for our region's growth and development. Many of today's challenges do not end at convenient geographical boundaries. Air pollution, traffic congestion, a growing population, and soaring utility prices. These are concerns not just for Bakersfield, but also for all of Kern County residents. Thank you, Cheryl. Our award recipients this evening demonstrate that improving one community can lead to better, healthier communities overall. Uh, they do this with the programs that have the power to transform lives, like the Dream Center and Hart Park After Dark. Leaders such as Bakersfield Fire Department's Douglas Grenier and the Detective Bureau of the California City Police Department show us each day the amazing potential that good deeds, creativity, and dedication to do, and dedication do to inspire our fellow residents and friends to carry the message forward and raise the region's quality of life for everyone. Fortunately, Kern Cog is not the only organization to recognize the important work performed by our award recipients tonight. Tonight's honorees will also be receiving certificates of recognition from the Kern County Board of Supervisors, Assemblymen Rudy Salas and Vince Fong, and also from Senators Gene Fuller and Andy Vidak, and from Congressmen David Valadeo Valade and Kevin McCarthy. Some of these people are in the room or in the audience themselves or have rep representatives here to offer their warmest regards. Please hold your applause until every person is recognized. And as I call your name, would you please stand up? <clears throat> Pam Rose from Senator Gene Fuller's office. Uh, Supervisor Zach Scrivener. Brandon Martin representing David Couch's office. And Christian Romo from Leticia Perez's office. Mayors and city councils from the cities of Arvin, Bakersfield, California City, Delano, McFarland, Shafter, Taft, and Wasco. We, are, we welcome you here and thank you for coming. The people that really make this program successful are out there with you, behind the lights. You meet Rochelle Invina and Angie Banuelos as you checked in. They assisted with registration. <laughs> Tammy Jones was crucial in collecting the reservations, managing and mail any mailings and requesting the certificates. Suzanne Campbell and our new Deputy Administrative Director, Becky Napier, made sure we had a script to read and helped organize the preparations you will see tonight. Without, <laughs> without these members of our staff, this program would not happen. Let's give them a round of applause. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of employees at Kern Government Television, better known as KGov, who have helped us develop this year's presentation, highlighting the programs and individuals being honored for their outstanding achievements. KGov. <laughs> the regional awards are again held, being recorded and will be replayed next month on KGov. This way, we have a chance to share the work of our honorees with all of Kern County. What really makes this event special is that our recipients can celebrate with friends and family. So thank you all for coming to provide your support to the honorees and to celebrate the wonderful gifts they have bestowed upon us. Now, on with the show. When two departments in our county come together, there is bound to be success. 
Art Park After Dark is the perfect example of this kind of partnership. Kern County Library Director Andy Apple heard of a program in San Diego County that invited residents to take part in fun activities planned at local parks. Andy realized Kern County Parks and Recreation needed a way to entice more people to visit our local parks and felt this was a great way to introduce our parks to our residents. Andy sought the help of the library's marketing coordinator, Jasmine Labasso. Together, they created an event that brought numerous county services together with local vendors and provided a fun evening that was educational as well. Hart Park was chosen as the ideal location due to its size and the county's love for this park. Planning for Hart Park After Dark began in August with a designated date of October 21st, 2017. This gave the committee two short months to pull all the pieces together and try to make this event a success. A Halloween theme was chosen given the time of year and county departments jumped right in volunteering various activities and games. Food, music, reading corners, story time, craft tables, and costume contests were also included. The marketing of this event was critical, so the committee chose to focus its attention on social media and ended up reaching 130,000 people through Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The event was estimated to bring 300 to 500 guests to the park but ended up drawing over 2,000 people for this one event. Hart Park After Dark demonstrated that the numerous departments within our county know how to put an event together that can showcase the beauty of a local park while providing fun and educational activities for all ages. This brainchild of Andy Apple and Jasmine Labasso has inspired everyone involved to start planning for the next big park event. We congratulate Hart Park After Dark's key planners, Andy Apple and Jasmine Lobasso, with the Kern County Library as the recipients of our 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Community Involvement and Local Government. Please welcome to the stage Andy Apple and Jasmine Lobasso. Yes, being five feet tall is probably not good for a podium of this size. <laughs> anyway, I'm Andy Apple, and this is uh, Jasmine Labasso, actually. I'm Andy Sullivan. I got married, but it just didn't officially change. Um, I'm very thankful for uh, Mr. Ryan Ossoff, our CAO, who let me run wild with this idea and how many county departments were just gung-ho to get involved and show the spirit that we are as a county family. So thank you so much for this award and the recognition of all the hard work that the county employees did. This was just my idea. It was the boots on the ground that made it. So thank you. I honestly think Andy said it all, um, <laughs> but really, uh, it really wasn't possible without all the county departments that jumped in and were willing to to offer their uh, resources. Uh, a a two-month turnaround time is really not possible without support, and so I really thank those people that helped us make it possible. The best voices for change come from the people who need it most, and this is the most evident with our residents in the southeast region of Kern County. Building healthy communities, Comunidades Unidas Action Team consists of different community leaders and groups that address issues directly impacting the residents of this area. Issues such as green spaces, wastewater services, pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements and housing and park investments. The residents of these unincorporated communities need a voice to help reach the key people in our community who can help improve these living conditions. That's where Comunidades Unidas steps into action. Engaging residents directly with policy and decision makers is the best way for them to be heard. Many residents in the smaller communities are not even sure where to start, which is why Comunidades Unidas is so beneficial. The team members get involved in the general plan update and help shape the county budget to incur some of these necessary changes, as well as encouraging residents to attend the workshops and council meetings where their concerns for their neighborhoods are voiced. 
Comunidades Unidas Action Team is a group of true leadership in Kern County and has motivated local residents in the outlying communities to show their willingness and commitment to making their communities stronger and more vibrant. Please join us in congratulating Gustavo Aguirre and Kimberly Alvarez on behalf of Building Healthy Communities as recipients of the 2017 Regional Award for Community Involvement. Please join us. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Alvarez and I am from the group Greenfield Walking Group and California Walks. Um, youth like me um, are really encouraged to make our community better for our future. And not only from my community are trying to make it better, but also from we incorporated with the youths from Boys and Girls Club from Lamont, and we are so happy to be part of this and making um, Comunidades Unidas Action Team a better because we want a better future for us and for the ones to follow us. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, can uh, all the uh, Comunidades Unidas uh, action team can get up just to uh, show your hands, please? <laughs> and, and this group is just uh, some of them. And, and as you can see, uh, we have a lot of youth and uh, you know, I'm not a good public speaker, but uh, I was thinking, we have a lot of youth. Are we, are we uh, developing the leaders of the future? I don't think so. We are leaders developing the leaders of today because uh, these youth are, are been walking the streets, knocking doors uh, to improve their communities. Some of the examples in, in Rexland Acres, uh, uh, youth took the, the leadership and uh, working with the county, we were able to secure uh, around six, uh, six million. In Lamont, we were able to secure, working with the county again, uh, 2.5 million. Uh, there are community gardens in Greenfield, in, in Arvin, in Shafter. Uh, we just met last night with uh, Lorelei, uh, uh, Ryan, we have a lot of meetings with them. And uh, so that's great that, uh, you know, we don't want just, uh, when we go and, and, and make comments with, uh, with government agencies, uh, we, we want to say, we don't go come here to ask, you know, we have a lot of needs in our communities, but we don't, we don't just ask, we come and say, how can we all together improve our communities? Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for uh, the recognition I know, uh, my main recognition will be to the, to the volunteers, to the residents. I've been paid to do that, but uh, they are giving their, their time because they want to see their communities improved. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's, uh, that makes us uh, very proud. We have groups like Greenfield Walking Group, Comité Progreso de Lamont, Comité for, uh, for Committee for Better Arvin, uh, uh, Literacy Council, uh, Central uh, California Environmental Justice Alliance, California Walks, and just to mention some of, some of the organizations and, and community groups. So, um, and as I mentioned, we work with uh, cities, with Arvin, with Shafter, in different cities throughout the county, and also with, uh, with different agencies in the, in the county. So uh, thank you very much to all the agencies, all the authorities, all the elected officials that are, are being willing to, to uh, meet with us and, and you know, put, put plans together and dream with us in, in our communities. Thank you so much. Active transportation is a perfect solution for improving the health of our communities. 
Encouraging commuters to get out of their cars and start bicycling and walking to work or school is a difficult task and something Bike Bakersfield, a local nonprofit advocacy group, takes very seriously. Bike Bakersfield activities span a broad spectrum of advocacy, recycling, multimodal consulting, and education. Their education classes are designed to teach safe cycling practices and to create a strong sense of community. And the monthly and seasonal activities they host, such as full moon rides and Christmas-like tours, helps to bring new and old bicyclists together where they feel safe riding. Seeing these large groups of bicyclists also sends a great message to drivers that it really is easy to share the road with other modes of transportation. As an advocacy group, Bike Bakersfield has excelled in collaborating with local businesses, law enforcement, school districts and elected officials to help increase everyone's awareness of active transportation options that are good for our air and beneficial for our physical well-being. Their Recycle a Bike program acquires used bikes from the community and allows patrons to earn a bike for 20 hours of volunteer service. Volunteers work with Bike Bakersfield's bicycle mechanics to refurbish and recycle these old bikes and provide low-cost transportation for people who might not otherwise be able to afford a bicycle. Partnerships with Chain Cone Styles, Kern Family Health, Kern Wheelman, and Kern County Supervisor Mike Maggard, just to name a few, have enabled Bike Bakersfield to distribute hundreds of bike helmets and light sets in some of our poorest communities. Bike rodeos and safety presentations are offered by Bike Bakersfield staff to numerous schools and businesses throughout our county. The ultimate message is to encourage more people to consider multimodal means of transportation such as walking, skating and bicycling, and pairing these modes with transit. Bike Bakersfield works diligently to transform our communities by reminding residents of the convenience and joy of bicycle transportation and offers solutions to the universal challenges of health, livability, and our environment. They have been a key player in working with our incorporated cities throughout the county on the development of their bicycle and pedestrian master plans, and the success of their hard work is witnessed with expanded bike lanes and increased community awareness. We are proud to present our 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Community Involvement to Jack Becker and Corinne Kanikeberg of Bike Bakersfield. <laughs> you pronounce that. Kanikeberg? Is that close? Thank you, we truly appreciate this award. Um, I've actually been around for as long as this award has been around, which is <laughs> kind of awesome. Uh, I wasn't around for all of 2017 with Bike Bakersfield. I joined in April, um, taking over after Jason and then Adam, just trying to continue the good work that we're doing, getting people on bikes, trying to improve the air quality, give people some other options for transportation, not everyone has access to a car, not everyone can afford to do things like that and to get around. Um, also with youth, we've been working a lot with youth, trying to get them on bikes, get them active. And I see a couple people in the community tonight that have been donating bikes to us. That's something that really helps us out. We're always giving bikes out. We need to make sure we get some bikes in so we can keep these programs going. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Jack didn't tell me I had to talk, but thanks anyway. Um, so I work for the Kern High School District, and since July we've been partnering with both Department of Human Services and Bike Bakersfield to provide bike safety and bicycle access to foster youth. It's been a great partnership. We get tons of referrals from the Dream Center, who you guys get to cheer on later in the evening. Um, and it's been a really great thing for these kids to learn that they can use their bicycle and their their own energy to get to and from school and work because so many of them don't have those opportunities that a lot of the rest of us have of parents buying us cars. So anyway, just want to say thanks to Bike Bakersfield and to the entire community for supporting all the work that we are doing. Thanks. We cannot argue that our children are our future, and we should equip them with all the tools necessary to be valuable contributors to the success of our communities. 
For foster youth, that possibility is a bit more difficult. Once a foster child ages out of the system at 18, they are on their own. Over one third of them will not finish high school or earn a GED. Almost a quarter of these youth will be incarcerated within the first two years of leaving the system and the same amount are reported to be homeless at least once in their lives. Experiencing post-traumatic stress and depression are common mental illnesses for these youth and they often resort to substance abuse as a way to cope. Kern County Network for Children has recognized these difficulties for foster youth for quite some time and have recently developed a solution that is indicative of its name, the Dream Center. The Dream Center is a highly innovative one-stop resource center for current and former foster youth up to age 24 and has made it possible for current foster youth to pursue their dreams and successfully transition into adulthood. Once again, we witness how a collaboration of several county departments can lead a program to success. With the involvement of Kern County Superintendents of Schools, the Department of Human Services, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, Public Health, Probation, Employers Training Resources, and so many more departments, social service agencies, and businesses throughout Kern County, the Dream Center team, members provide youth with information referral, encouragement, and advocacy services. In addition to this, youth can use the Dream Center computers, phone, fax, photocopier, scanner, and mailing services. Equally important to the menu of services is the supportive relationships that the youth develop with the Dream Center team, as well as the peer support and social connections. With no room for a marketing budget, the Dream Center functions on word of mouth alone. New youth commonly state that they heard about the Dream Center from other youth, which is the best testament of all. Operating expenses are shared by partner agencies that would allocate these services regardless of their location and services are provided in kind by Dream Team member agencies. Community donations make it possible to provide the youth with essential basic need items, and thanks to firmly rooted partnerships, the Dream Center is not reliant on grant funding. A total of 751 unduplicated foster youth received services from the Dream Center during fiscal year 2016 through 17. An average of 200 foster youth visit the center each week. As a highly sustainable, youth-driven, and community-supported service, the Dream Center is improving the quality of life for Kern's foster youth and ultimately for Kern's future. The 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Community Involvement is presented to the Dream Center. Accepting the award is Tom Corson of the Kern County Network for Children. I'm only accepting this is truly a, an integrated approach to providing services to some of our most needy kids. Uh, you heard some of the stats, but trust me, some of these kids are absolutely amazing. Uh, but we couldn't do this without the foundation, the superintendent of the schools providing the facility, the county of Kern willing to step up and think out of the box in co-locating staff from multiple agencies. I think of other nonprofit organizations like Bike Bakersfield that is instrumental to our youth. Um, I look over and I see Get, I see a familiar face that makes sure every so often some day passes show up at our place. So this is truly an integrated approach to providing services to the kids that are most in need. And I thank our community for stepping up and giving these kids a voice and an opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Obtaining money to fix our roads is no small task, and for a county as large as ours, the task can be even more challenging. However, with the vision and hard work of Yolanda Alcantar and her advanced planning team, Kern County Public Works has been successful in submitting some of the strongest funding proposals in our state, and this money is able to address much needed improvements in some of our smallest communities. Yolanda has been employed by Kern County since 2000. She has worked in planning, community development, and roads and public works. Most recently, she was promoted to Public Works Manager and is tasked with the advanced planning, environmental clearances, and grant applications for all Public Works projects. Her vision, attention to detail, and ability to find solutions to complex issues has resulted in success at the federal and state level on numerous funding projects. She is highly respected by her colleagues and staff, as well as the many agencies she interacts with.
We are proud to present our 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Transportation to Yolanda Alcantar for her Public Works Advanced Planning Team. Thank you. I feel truly honored to receive this recognition from Kern Cog. And if it wouldn't have been for the support of the Kern County Public Work Directors, Craig Pope and Lynn Brooks, this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, I've thrown some crazy ideas out at them and they, they're like, you want to do what? But they you know, still support me in the effort. Um, our Public Works staff works really hard. Uh, they're very dedicated to making the roads safer. It's a challenge, there's many challenges within our road system, but it's easy to be passionate about roads because uh, they impact all of us. After all, the lives of our family and community are at stake. Um, it's said that the road to success is always under construction, and given that my advanced planning section has only been in existence for two years, and we finally are figuring, figuring out what we need to do, I believe that the best is yet to come. Thank you. In the late 1990s, the city of Bakersfield recognized deficiencies along State Route 178 and started planning on ways to improve it along the interchanges of Fairfax Road and Morning Drive. Funding became available in 2005 when retired Congressman William Thomas secured $630 million for major transportation projects in metropolitan Bakersfield. State Route 178 was just one of many projects to benefit from this funding. To manage these funds and projects, a collaboration was developed between the City of Bakersfield, County of Kern, Caltrans, and Kern Council of Governments, known as the Thomas Roads Improvement Program, or TRIP. This multi-agency partnership approached the concerns of our local road projects from diverse viewpoints and worked as a team to find the best, most cost-effective solutions that could expedite project completion. T.Y. Lynn International was selected as the designer of the State Route 178 project at State Route 184, and local business Granite Construction came in as the lowest bidder as the project contractor. Since T.Y. Lynn also designed the 178 Morning Drive Interchange, they were able to coordinate design plans to eliminate potential throwaway work, ultimately saving taxpayers dollars. Plans were quickly underway to expedite an accelerated schedule that required close coordination between all parties involved. The true miracle was accomplishing this with all of the roadblocks along the way. Throughout the process, the team was required to make several design refinements. There were issues with utility relocation because of limited right of way. The age of the highway added to difficulties of relocating utilities. Approximately 700 feet of water line had to be modified and relocated, and the discovery of an eight inch gas line, which had been installed within two inches of the pavement structural pavement, caused additional impacts. Then there was the poor soil properties in that area, which caused the construction equipment to sink and not to mention the environmental concerns of the endangered San Joaquin kit fox. Mitigation and monitoring had to occur throughout the construction process. All workers were required to attend threatened and endangered species training prior to working on the job site. And finally, the city had to pay into the Metropolitan Bakersfield Habitat Conservation Program for loss of potential habitat for these kit foxes. The team met on a weekly basis to address the construction challenges and resolve any issues, and because of this commitment, the project was completed on time and within budget. It's not very often that a local roads project receives national recognition, but the city of Bakersfield is proud to share that the Thomas Roads Improvement Program State Route 178 widening project was recognized in the Roads and Bridges magazine as one of their top 10 roads in America in 2017. Quite an honor considering the magnitude of this project and the hurdles that had to be overcome in order to complete it on time. And we can't be outdone nationally without recognizing the value of this project to all of us locally. We are proud to present the Regional Award of Merit for Transportation to Thomas Roads Improvement Program for the completion of the State Route 178's widening project. Accepting the award is Trip Manager Chris Budak.
Well, that was pretty much my speech. So um, I'm just supposed to say thank you and walk off. Um, I, I do just want to add that this was a, a, an exciting project because um, they, they said it was a 178 widening project, but it really was just a utility relocation project with a little bit of pavement on the sides. <laughs> um, we spent many months looking for utility or moving utilities, finding utilities we didn't think were there. Utilities that we were knew they were, were there were in the wrong spot. They were actually in conflict. So it was it was a, a lot of effort between the designer, Granite Construction, and our um, NV5 was our uh, construction management group. Um, we did ask Palm Water. I don't know if you've ever heard of Palm Water. It's a real small district. We asked them to come find their utility one day, and three guys showed up with shovels. So we had a lot of <laughs> interesting interaction with our group out there. Um, it was a great project. Glad to be part of it. And um, Trip is still doing a lot. Uh, you can see us on the roads pretty much everywhere from Truxton to 58 to 99. And um, we just hope we're improving transportation within the city of Bakersfield. And everybody appreciates uh, when it's done, being able to drive on it and being more efficient and getting from, more, from one place to another more quickly. Thank you. This year will mark Golden Empire Transit's 45th anniversary of providing transportation service to Metropolitan Bakersfield. Over the years, GET has grown to a fleet of 90 compressed natural gas buses equipped with wheelchair lifts and bike racks and has 16 routes that operate seven days a week and transport more than 6 million passengers each year. In addition, GET operates 21 compressed natural gas GET-A-Lift buses, the curb-to-curb -curb service that provides another transportation option for the disabled and elderly. Over the last 45 years, GET has had to make many changes to accommodate the ever-changing needs of our community. From adjusting and adding routes to modifying the marketing of services, GET is open to trying new things to help reach those commuters best served by transit. One phenomenal service offered by GET that is worthy of recognition is their Summer Youth Pass program. This program is an innovation concept that focuses on the transit needs and independent mobility of Bakersfield's youth. It was designed to provide affordable travel for youth up to the age of 20. The low-cost $20 passes offer unlimited rides during the month of purchase. This service has seen incredible growth during the months of June, July, and August, which is a notable time for ridership to decline due to summer vacations. These passes help offer transportation for youth who are attending summer classes, working summer jobs, or just enjoying their summer off at the movies, gym, or mall. Get recognized the need of their younger ridership and created a service that would best suit them. The Summer Youth Pass not only provides affordable transportation for these young people, but helps to reduce numerous cars from our roads at a time when the extreme temperatures and dry climate can wreak havoc on our air quality. The air-conditioned buses provide comfortable cushioned seats and bike racks for riders to combine their modes of transportation. It's a win-win situation. The Summer Youth Pass program improves access to transportation for the community's youth while boosting GET's summer ridership, notes Karen King, GET's CEO. We're doubly excited to see so many new young riders taking advantage of the Summer Youth Pass program each year. This past year proved to be one of the most successful for the Summer Youth Pass. In the month of June alone, over 1,100 passes were sold. Outreach and marketing to our local academic institutions as well as increased social media and ads in the local Maya Theater and City of Bakersfield Parks and Recreation Guide helped to increase awareness about this program. A point of purchase survey for the 2017 Summer Youth Pass customers revealed that nearly 70% of the passes sold were to first-time users. The Summer Youth Pass program is a primary example of how GET is continuously working and improving transportation in the region. The 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Transportation goes to GET Buses Summer Youth Program. Accepting this award is GET CEO Karen King and the Chairman of GET's Board, Cindy Para. Good evening, I'm Cindy Para. I am the current chair at Golden Empire Transit and it is indeed an honor to be here. Uh, this is always one of my favorite events to attend every year because there's so many positive stories that come out of this evening, things that you don't know that's going on in the community and for you to in, uh, include us in that with our summer youth pass program is just awesome. 22% uh, of our riders 
uh, take the bus to school. So naturally, during the summer months, we would lose ridership. Staff came up with having the summer youth pass, and that has just been amazing, like uh, the presentation said. Uh, uh, kudos to our marketing department, who's went out and marketed the $20 reduced pass, and I just wanna say, encourage other people to get on the get bus, get bus. <laughs> I can't top that, but I would like to uh, specifically recognize Albert Garza and Braulio Mendoza on our marketing team. They actually go out in person and recruit youth to ride the bus, uh, talk to people one by one, and it's great to see new young people taking public transit, and we hope they'll continue to be riders. This past year, one of the things that really made a difference was we upped our social media presence, and I can't say enough about that and how much effect that has had on attracting particularly younger people to ride public transit. So thank you for this recognition this evening. Uh, it really goes to the staff. The city of Delano relies exclusively on groundwater for residents and businesses. The groundwater supply is provided by 15 production wells to cover the entire surface area. In 2012, the city had to construct 10 new wells due to excessive arsenic concentrations in the area's groundwater. This project was completed in 2014 and equipped these new wells with arsenic treatment facilities. But then water produced by one of the new wells started to show signs of nitrate concentrations that were exceeding the state's maximum contaminant level. Delano needed to find a fix, but more importantly was to find the money to support the fix. They sponsored an application for state grant funds to pilot, design, and construct a full-scale biological nitrate treatment facility. The three-year project consisted of a 10-month pilot study, design, construction, and permitting of the full-scale demonstration facility operation of the demonstration facility for 12 months and dissemination of the project's results. The project was successful and brought well number 35 back into compliance and is now able to deliver safe drinking water to its residents. Now what makes this project so unique is that the process used to eliminate the nitrates from the affected well, known as biological denitrification, has been used for decades to remove nutrients from wastewater. Transferring the technology and altering it somewhat to be applicable for fixing the problem with well number 35 was a bit complex, but something the city was willing to invest in. Since nitrate contamination of groundwater is common in agricultural areas, this technology had the opportunity to help thousands of other residents and businesses throughout the Central Valley, known for its vast agriculture. The city of Delano showed great innovation and leadership by using the Prop 50 state research money to fund this project. To add to the success of this project, the city has been asked by the State Water Board to conduct two additional nitrate removal pilot studies for smaller rural areas, and they are leading efforts to educate and train the public. The 2017 Ken Volpe Regional Award of Merit for Environmental Resources and Conser Conservation is presented to the City of Delano's Wellhead Nitrate Treatment Demonstration Project. Accepting the award is Delano's, Delano's Mayor Grace Vallejo. I'm like the other short person, um, and I have heels on. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, yes, she does. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> you know uh, that was a mouthful of how it was introduced and the presentation and all, but I have to tell you that uh, our biggest concern was that our residents uh, were getting the type of water that nobody ever wants to get, and they deserved better. And for this very reason, we thought that the risk was well worth it. And we've had to shut down uh, well since then, and we treat them, we do everything possible so that our residents get the best drinking water available. 
Obviously, all of you know that the drought makes it harder. We have to dig deeper uh, to get water, and that brings up uh, more things than what we want to bring up. Uh, but we were very fortunate that Carollo, and I did drag Penny up here because she is from Carollo. The Biota Project, this was their baby, and we were willing to uh, have it done in our city on Well 35. And it is so successful that, as you heard, we're going to uh, do the same thing again in a couple of other wells. So I encourage anyone that is having issues with their water to check into the Biota Project, as we call it. And uh, for that, I thank Penny. Penny, if you'd like to come up and say a few words, because Corolla was their baby. Thank you. My name is Penny Carlo. I'm with Carollo Engineers, and uh, we are the design engineer for the uh, Biota facility. And I uh, want to thank the Council of Governments for awarding this to the city of Delano. Uh, they embraced a new emerging technology with this project. This is the first permitted project in the state of its kind and in the United States. And what uh, I think makes it especially deserving of this award is in terms of conservation and sustainability. Uh, the process removes nitrates from the groundwater without uh, creating a brine stream that has to be disposed of, and it is also not requiring salts uh, to run the process. So it's um, energy, um, you know, it's energy uh, efficient and it's not producing costly waste that have to be disposed of in order to produce a clean drinking water for the residents of Delano. They embraced this project. Uh, it involved all uh, members of the community and in all levels of uh, the city and departments. It was a true team effort to um, you know, implement this from all um, aspects of the project and in uh, partnering with our state regulators. And um, I think it's very exciting that they have a treatment plant now that is producing clean water that the residents are drinking. It is also a educational facility and uh, it's available for tours if anybody wants to come and see it. And um, you know, to further the education of this technology. And I want to thank the city of Delano again and the Council of Governments. And you know, they're, we're the ones that are up here accepting awards and everything, but really and truly uh, our staff, they were the workers that work with Biota. So I would like to ask Craig, Edwin, and Joe to please stand up. They are from our staff. They worked continually with Corolla to get this done. Thank you. Most little boys dream about growing up to be a police officer, but down the road they change their minds and take a different path. Not so for Edward Whiting, Chief of Police for Taft. Ed Whiting has dedicated over 35 years to law enforcement. Ed began wearing a uniform long before entering the academy when he served his country in the United States Air Force as a member of the security police. He started his public service with the city of Taft Police Department over 32 years ago. He transferred from the city of McFarland Police Department and quickly promoted up through the ranks at Taft, obtaining senior officer status in 1989, police sergeant in 1990, lieutenant in 2008, and his current rank as chief in 2012. During most of his early years with the city, he served as the narcotics investigator for the department, developing an expertise in narcotics investigation that allowed him to serve the local courts as a certified narcotics expert. In 1988, he was named officer of the year. Ed has proven passion for his profession that truly exemplifies all things law enforcement, and it is believed that this passion started with his father, William E. Whiting. William was well known for his groundbreaking communications accomplishments, so much so that the Kern County Communications Center is named after William E. Whiting. Ed emanates his love of his community through his participation as a range master and his membership on the Kern Chiefs Council, Office of Emergency Services, and the Street Interdiction Team for the county. Ed also holds a seat on the Westick Board of Directors and is a member of the Kiwanis Club of Taft. 
Some of the more rewarding responsibilities for Ed was being a part of Shop with a Cop, the annual 911 series at Kern County Raceway Park, the implementation of local crime mapping, and Coffee with a Cop. He strongly believes in service along with supporting his officers. He insists on qualifying at the shooting range with his officers and every year he shows up to work and sends officers home on Christmas Day so they can enjoy the holiday with their families as he covers their shifts. And you may think that serving for the wonderful community of Taft would not come with some interesting stories, but it's been said that Ed has a few of his own. He contributed on the murder for hire case from San Francisco that had ties to Taft and was able to assist with the Jeffrey Dahmer case while visiting back east. The most impressive stories are when he has assisted local parents who might be struggling with wayward children by providing stern talks, rides in police cars, and visits to the local jail. Ed excelled at providing his own kind of scared straight program for the community of Taft. the 2017 Richard A. Maxwell Regional Award of Merit for Public Safety is presented to Chief Edward Whiting with the City of Taft Police Department. Thank you very much. Um, one of my favorite presidents, Ronald Reagan, once said that some people spend an entire lifetime wondering if their lives made a difference in the world. Well, after my retirement party, which was really great, by the way, last Saturday, <laughs> and tonight, now I don't, now I know too. Um, I would like to thank the Kern Council of Governments tonight for this very awesome award and for all the collaborative support for all of us here in this room tonight. I would be remiss if I didn't thank everybody at the city of Taft, from the elected officials, the mayor, and the city council persons that are here tonight especially, to all the city staff from the city manager uh, down to the assistant city manager and human resources and finance directors and all the city staff at City Hall and of course the staff at the police department, my administrative assistant, uh, my command staff, captain and lieutenant are here tonight, the officers and the sergeants and all the support personnel at the city of Taft. Uh, none of this could have occurred over the 30 plus years without their support and their very hard work, and for them, I'm very grateful to all of them. And last but not least, I also need to thank my wife of 30 years, Robin. Um, she has endured quite a bit over that lifetime uh, from the many different call-outs, the investigations, the surveillances, uh, a couple of officer-involved shootings, um, lots of press coverage, uh, and she's endured all of it like a trooper, and she's also my best friend, and I couldn't thank her nearly enough for all those years. Thank you very much. Though California City has a relatively small population, it is not immune from part one crimes defined as homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, stolen vehicles, and arson. Between November 15, 2016 and the same date in 2017, the Detective Bureau recorded 512 Part 1 criminal cases. The Detective Bureau is manned by Sergeant Shannon Hayes, a 13-year employee, and Detective John Boston, a four-year employee. Each are actively working on 30 and 25 cases, respectively. Small municipal police departments on numerous occasions face challenges in the performance of their duties due to the low number of police officers employed. California City, for example, currently employs 16 sworn police officers. Many times, members of the department's detective bureau get pulled away from critical investigations to perform patrol duties or other important tasks. Yet their dedication to solving crimes is never deterred. Detective John Boston and Sergeant Shannon Hayes have built a highly successful working relationship with the district attorney's office that has proven to be invaluable when it comes to convicting cases. They have established a long-lasting relationship with the District Attorney's Office Victim Assistance Unit, which helps link victims and their families to the support they need through very difficult, life-changing events. The 
process to prosecute some of the most heinous of crimes can take between 18 to 24 months before these cases make it before a judge. Victims of Part 1 crimes are often transient and may move several times. Sergeant Hayes and Detective Boston work hard to maintain contact with the victims to ensure prosecution, and on numerous accounts, they will personally provide transportation even outside of the jurisdiction to ensure they are able to appear in court for critical hearings. The Detective Bureau also works with the most heartbreaking cases in law enforcement. The abuse of a minor child, spouse, partner, or murder cases, all of which are handled with the greatest compassion, can at the same time leave deep emotional scars. Victims of these crimes don't trust many people, let alone law enforcement. However, their team builds and maintains that trust. In one case, there was a six-year-old boy that was a victim of a family member. Not only did Detective Boston drive out of county on a handful of occasions to make sure the young boy and his mother were able to attend important court hearings, but on the day the young boy was required to testify, Detective Boston coordinated with the boy's mother and wore a matching dress shirt and tie to court so the boy would feel like he had a friend in the courtroom with him. In another recent case, a woman was badly beaten by her longtime boyfriend in front of their two small children. She was in need of a medical exam that would enable her to be treated and would also provide valuable evidence for the prosecution of the person responsible for her injuries. Sergeant Hayes drove her and her children to the hospital and while the mother was in the examination room, he stayed with her two little boys and kept them safe. He held them, read stories, and played blocks with them to keep them distracted while their mother was being cared for. Deputy District Attorney Christopher Puck says he has nothing but respect and appreciation for Sergeant Hayes and Detective Boston. DDA Puck is assigned to prosecute violent felonies in East Kern County. Initially, he was only to serve for six months. Now, 11 months later, he is still prosecuting East Kern violent felonies because of the work done by Sergeant Hayes and Detective Boston and the deputies in Mojave. DDA Puck cited the work done by a tight-knit team as a successful model in the prosecution of these cases. He stated that he would not be able to prosecute without their dedication to the victims and their cases. The District Attorney's Victim Service Unit is the third element to this team. Vanessa Anderson is the Victim Services Specialist serving the East Kern County area. DDA Puck said this team is a great example of how to build good cases for prosecution, investigation, sound report submission, and victim support. While investigating new cases, the Detective Bureau also maintains contact with the families of older unresolved cases. In March of 2017, Sergeant Hayes, Detective Boston, and Vanessa Anderson organized a candlelight vigil to remember victims and asked the public to come forward with information that might help them locate the perpetrators of these crimes. Is with, it's with the greatest of pride that I announce the 2017 Richard A. Maxwell Region Award of Merit for Public Safety presented to the California City Police Department Detective Bureau. Please welcome Detective John Boston and Sergeant Shannon Hayes. Sorry, another short person here. Um, um, yeah, I don't know what the big deal is. I mean, it's kind of interesting you get an award for doing your job. Um, but anyways, uh, some people to thank. First off, I do have to thank my beautiful wife, Jessica. Uh, she's, as Chief Whiting said, endured a lot um, through military deployments, SWAT call-outs, detective call-outs, endless shift. Mm -hmm. um, she's endured a lot and as a trooper. Um, some mentors that helped me along the way um, through my career, I have to thank them as well. Um, one I, guess I just saw was a former uh, recipient of this reward, of award, uh, Steve Colrick, um, Ron Bell, um, Jeff Takeda, um, current Lieutenant uh, Frank Huizar, his leadership and mentorship is invaluable. Um, so, and John. The, I can't ask for a better partner. Uh, your dedication is, uh, is unbelievable. So, appreciate it. Thank you. I'm uh, 
deeply honored to be receiving this award. Like uh, my partner said here, you know, it's we just go out there every day and do our job. Uh, our department is very small. We're extremely overworked and have tons of cases. Um, we work to the best of our ability. Sergeant Hayes here, my little partner. Um, <laughs> you know, he, between the two of us, there's many, many nights to where we just, you know, we'll go to work on Wednesday and we'll come home on Friday. Um, we've pulled 72 hour shifts um, to get cases filed. Um, I don't know if you guys have known or have seen in the papers in this past week alone, we've uh, arrested two homicide suspects that are currently being arraigned today. Um, or were arraigned yesterday. Um, you know, like Chief Whiting, my sergeant, I wanna thank my wife, my daughter over there. I spend many, many hours away from home. And uh, without them supporting me, you know, this would be very, very difficult. I also wanna thank the mayor, city councilman Gomez. Um, they too are, are very supportive of us. So thank you. protect and serve are powerful action words and sometimes difficult to do on a consistent basis. But you would never experience hesitation or angst when you witness McFarland Police Chief Scott Kimball spring into action. Talking the talk and walking the walk is an accurate description of Chief Kimball, as he has always demonstrated a true passion to serving the residents of his community and providing the best possible protection from harm. Three years ago, the city of McFarland was blessed to have Scott Kimball step into the role as chief of their police department. For nearly 30 years, Chief Kimball has been in public service, and for those who have been fortunate to know him, know his service is a year-round commitment. In fact, his values for safety and community service consume most of the hours in his day, and he handles it all with ease. Chief Kimball has served in numerous leadership positions during his law enforcement career. From police academy recruit training officer to lieutenant, sergeant, and field training officer, Chief Kimball has had the opportunity to supervise many high-profile incidents, including drive-by shootings, officer-involved shootings, fatal traffic collisions, and high-speed pursuits. Although these cases can prove to be dangerous and stressful, they never soured Chief Kimball's main mission, to protect and serve. Some say what makes Chief Kimball such a great supervisor is his wealth of knowledge, professionalism, and experience serving in several capacities of law enforcement. Also, just as critical is his true passion to know and interact with the people he serves. Chief Kimball has always believed in community-oriented and relationship-based policing. He truly enjoys the community of McFarland and the many wonderful events he is invited to participate in. He feels the community needs to know his heart to truly trust him, and the same request is extended to his officers so the residents of McFarland feel safe in the community they call home. Crime prevention, education, and social programs represent such a small portion of the daily duties that Chief Kimball and his department make available to the community members and business owners. Chief's success comes from his gift to teach, inspire, and mentor. The youth of McFarland are of particular interest to Chief Kimball because he recognizes that they are the future. He made the Police Explorer Program and Police Activities League program a high priority in his department and is committed to offer young adults interested in a career in law enforcement a personal awareness of the criminal justice system through training, practical experiences, and other activities. These programs have been successful in building character and work ethics in all youth that participate. At the core of Chief Scott Kimball has always been his commitment to serve and protect the people of McFarland. This is evident in many community activities his department has launched, such as town hall meetings, coffee with a cop, Easter egg hunt with a cop, and national night out. His department has also conducted numerous cops and candy celebrations, Operation Thanksgiving food basket giveaways, Operation Christmas giveaways, shop with a cop, bicycle safety rodeos, in addition to numerous school and senior safety and crime prevention events. Hard work, service to others, public safety, and faith and family are important guiding principles for Chief Kimball, and he lives by these principles every single day. The 
2017 Richard A. Maxwell Regional Award of Merit for Public Safety is presented to McFarland Police Chief Scott Kimball. Wow, <laughs> thank you. It's an honor to be here tonight. Um, there's so many things we've done in McFarland. I'd like to thank these four tables over here who've come to support me tonight. Uh, could you all stand, please? Just give them a hand. I'd like to thank our mayor, Mayor Manuel Cantu, our city manager, John Wooner. He couldn't be here tonight. He's unfortunately sick. That flu bug is still going around. And, and um, he'd like to be here and he expressed to me to make sure that I told everyone that he was sorry that he couldn't make it tonight. I'd also like to thank our council members who are here in attendance tonight and a couple of them couldn't make it, but I know they would be here if they could. And I have many city community members here, staff members from the police department and friends and I'd like to thank you all. When we talk about policing today, I think it's really, really important that we understand that there's some challenges that weren't there in 1989 when I started in police work. I remember one, uh, <laughs> I don't have a, a fond memory of my first chief, really, uh, because those were the days when you hardly saw your chiefs. And I don't know if any of you remember those days, but chiefs weren't really involved in much in the communities in 1989. They kind of spoke about community-oriented policing, and it was a buzzword or just a phrase that they used to express what we were supposed to be doing. But I don't really think we did that, honestly. And I remember my first chief, uh, those days we had to stand at attention in the hallway when the chief was coming down the hall. So I saw my chief coming, and here he comes, and I stood at attention with my back against the wall, and he walked past me, and he says, good morning, Bill. And I thought, well, I can't look around because I'm supposed to be at attention, but I didn't see anybody else in the hall here. So after he walked away and on down the hall, then I looked, and there was nobody else in the hall. So uh, he never called me any other name except Bill the whole entire time that uh, I worked there. <laughs> so I don't know who Bill is, but uh, uh, <laughs> it's just uh, one of the things I think that a leader must do is he must know his people. He's got to know his people and spend time with his people. And at the McFarland Police Department, when I started there almost four years ago now as chief, uh, it's an honor to serve there. It's an honor to be the chief there and to provide public safety and security to the citizens there. Uh, but there was a lot of challenges in McFarland. You can Google the city of McFarland, which I'm sure some of you have done or seen in the media. And in those times, there was a lot of challenges before I became chief. I've been fortunate to have almost a whole new team of police officers there and staff members who do a wonderful job. They take direction well. They're eager to learn. Um, they follow the vision that I set of establishing a world-class police department for McFarland. And we do many events, as you saw in the video. And those events have helped us tremendously to the point where we are today with three weeks ago that the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security announced the 100 safest cities in California with a population of over 5,000 people in their cities. There's some cities on the list that have upwards of 500,000 population. So we are number 60th on that safest list. And that, you would say, might almost be impossible for a small department like McFarland. I don't have a large staff and I don't have a large core of leaders there either. Uh, unfortunately, um, our city is, is continuing to grow though, and that's a great thing, but with the help of all the officers, understanding the vision, the mission statement, the value statement, and also understanding teamwork, and the community understanding the same things, we've bonded together and developed many partnerships that have taken us to that 60th safest city in the state of California. It takes a lot of eyes and ears in communities to do police work nowadays. 
Community members have to be a part of the police department. You have to partner with them. I want to thank all of our community members in McFarland, the business owners, the residents, the organizations there for all their support. I want to thank all these folks for all their support here tonight because I couldn't do what I do without their support and them taking the vision that I set of that world-class police department and believing in it because we're well on our way to attaining that. And I'm just so thankful to be here tonight and receive this award. I also wanted to call the mayor up and our two council members, Rafael Melendez and Vidal Santiano, because I believe they wanted to say a couple of words as well. Thank you very much. Anyways, I know one of these is working. Um, I want to thank uh, Chief, and like he said, um, uh, it's great when you can find great leaders and then you give them the opportunities, give them the tools to do what they have to do in keeping our city safe. Uh, McFarland is a very fortunate city. We're very blessed. We thank God for our staff, and thank you, Chief. And uh, I'll let uh, some of the other members. So, Chief says he has a passion to serve. I just want to give you a small example. Um, I got a flat tire going northbound on the on-ramp of Whistler Avenue, close to McFarland. I get off, get on the phone, call my wife, because I don't have the tools to change a tire. After I hang up, Chief calls me. Hey, Rafael, how's it going? I thought he'd call me for a burrito or something, but <laughs> I looked at my time, and it's, it's going to be close to 6 o'clock. He goes, well, you know, I got a flat tire. Yeah, I could see, right, that, that you got a flat tire. I said, ah, how can he do that, right? <laughs> well, he's on the opposite side of the freeway going uh, south on the on-ramp southbound, right? But he pulls over, takes his time to give me a call because I don't know how he recognized me. I'm two point some miles away from him, right? And you figure you're going to get on the on-ramp, you pay attention to the road, negotiate the road to get on the freeway, right? <laughs> no, this guy sees me through a guardrail, you know, <laughs> see, sees a blue car over there stalled, and he figures it's me. He figures, right? I don't know how, but he calls me. I tell him my problem, my situation, and he decides to come back, come over the uh, Whistler Avenue, and he waits with me, you know, and my wife shows up, we take care of the tire, but that's a true passion of service. I mean, who else is gonna look across the freeway to see who's that blue Camaro down there, right? <laughs> and pull over and call, not too many people call, right? They usually go by, ah, oh, he'll be fine, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's got a cell phone, you know, he'll call us for help, somebody will come by, but he didn't, he didn't. He came around, actually he reversed backwards on that on ramp, right? But he did, he did. So that's his true passion of service. Hey man, it is what it is, you know? <laughs> yeah. But that's his true passion of service, and even though it's a small thing, he took the time to check out the situation, and that's true service in, in my book, and I appreciate that, and thank you, Chief. Great story. Uh, Chief Kimball. Appreciate it very much. It's a, it's a hard work, what he does. It's a tough job. He's been doing so good. I mean, we're lucky enough, like the mayor said, and Chief said it also. McFarland's been a small community. We're growing. We got a good vision. We got the right group of people from top to bottom. And, and, and I feel proud of being McFarland, because McFarland, before, 20-something years ago, I used to work in Bakersfield. And they all asked me, where are you from? I said, McFarland. Where's McFarland at? It's like, well, I mean, come on, you, we have to know where McFarland is. It's not 20 miles from Bakersfield. Now it's like, I go places, where are you from, McFarland? Oh, yeah, you guys made a movie. Yes, I mean, that, that, <laughs> now, now they know where McFarland is. But, you know, Chief is doing a great job. Chief is doing a great job. He's got the right people. He's a good person, uh, not just because he's here. I mean, I'd say because <laughs> he is a good person, uh, his family, wife, and I'm very proud to say he's our chief. Thank you, everybody. The Regional Award of Merit for Innovation is a relatively new category for recognition, first introduced in 2014. It has only had two recipients before tonight. Although a tough category to fill, its importance with the insurgence of technology is all that more important. Technology is influencing our lives in numerous ways, and the city of Bakersfield recognized this power and is using it to be more transparent and comprehensive for its residents. 
The city's open budget platform is a perfect example of an innovative project. As a web-based application that provides a visual, intuitive means of exploring and analyzing the city's revenues, operating in capital budgets, the graphs and tables found within the platform are interactive, which allows the users to dig down into the budget and see how the city funds are allocated across all city departments. In the past, residents could only access information regarding the city budget by viewing a budget book and accompanying documents online. The book was static, meaning that once it was published, it could not be updated regularly with monthly expenditure data, and it couldn't be viewed or modified in any other format than PDF. The open budget platform transforms this data into a dynamic, easy to use portal, which allows the user limitless opportunities to compare budget projections and displays actual revenue and expenditure in a more real time scenario. It is no secret that managing and analyzing budgets is not glamorous for everyone. But since the budgets are funded by taxpayer dollars, it's important for even those who aren't savvy in basic accounting principles to feel comfortable when questioning where the money is being spent. This open budget platform and its technologies removes the barriers normally associated with complicated budget information and creates a user-friendly environment in which the data can be presented in multiple different configurations based on the user's preferences. The City of Bakersfield recognizes the importance as the largest city in our county to provide the public with accurate and timely budget data information. The Open Budget Platform is one of the many tools the City employs to improve the regional community because these funds finance the many projects and services directly affecting not only the residents of our city, but the individuals from other Kern County cities and unincorporated areas that may visit or conduct business here. The 2017 Regional Award of Merit for Innovation is presented to the City of Bakersfield for their open budget platform. Accepting the award is Assistant City Manager Chris Hewatt and Assistant Finance Director Ma Randy McKeegan. Well, thank you. We're trying to make municipal budgeting exciting. Uh, <laughs> With that, I just want to thank a couple people real quick. Aaron and his staff and the Kern Cog Board, thank you very much. Uh, our City Council, some of the members are here this evening for supporting and uh, helping us uh, with getting this project going and, and seeing it through. Uh, our City Management team, including City Manager Alan Tandy, as well as our Finance Department and Tech Services Department who kind of connected the dots and, and got this to work. I want to say that I think all of us uh, here are with agencies that are responsible for collecting and expending millions, hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars each and every year. Uh, and I think it's imperative that uh, we have tools that show where that money is going and what it's being used for. And so we hope this tool helps with that cause and we're happy to have it rolled out and functional. And uh, we look forward to uh, utilizing it for years to come. Thank you very much. Tough act to follow after the important showing of the important work for law enforcement to, to, to really point to an icon on our website to, that really delves into our budget. But um, I really appreciate the Council of Governments uh, recognizing our efforts to improve transparency for the citizens of the City of Bakersfield. I would be remiss also not to to, to miss out on thanking. Sandra uh, Jimenez, the former assistant finance director, who really took the, to use a football analogy, she took the ball to the red zone and I sort of just walked it across the goal line. So I really appreciate her, her help on that as well. So thank you very much. California definitely experienced more than its fair share of wildfires this past year. And when the wildfires hit, Firefighters from neighboring counties and cities are called to assist. Bakersfield's central location puts it in a prime spot to help numerous fire stations throughout our great state, and we are proud to step up and serve. The commitment and passion for excellence is why Bakersfield Fire Department gleans so much respect from stations throughout California, and this respect is warranted due to the leadership of Chief Douglas Greener. Chief Greener has been a change catalyst for the Bakersfield Fire Department, spearheading significant breakthroughs, dramatic transformations, revolutions of thought and clarity on the importance of common purpose. Chief Greener began his fire service as a reserve firefighter with the Los Angeles County Fire Department in 1982. He has served with the Bakersfield community as a firefighter since 1988 
and rose through the ranks of the department, serving at the busiest stations and acquiring experience, training, and education in various fire service capacities. He has led the organization as fire chief since 2010. It's no wonder he has a passion for fighting fires because it's in his blood. He is a third generation firefighter following the footsteps of his father and grandfather who both served with the Los Angeles City Fire Department. Chief Greener has played a vital role in several projects such as the improvement of the Insurance Service Officer classification, the 9-11 Memorial Project, and several technological advancements and enhancements in effective emergency response. He has transformed the department and the firefighters by communicating vision, clarifying purposes, and aligning procedures with principles. His leadership style has influenced others, and members of the department follow him because they want to, not because of his role as fire chief. In addition to his work overseeing 14 stations and 240 sworn support and reserve personnel, Chief Greener stays involved in community organizations such as the Bakersfield Firefighters Relief Association, Bakersfield Firefighters Burn Foundation, and American Red Cross Board of Directors. He is a past president of the CSUB Alumni Board and part of the CSUB Council of 100. This community involvement, along with his professional affiliations and his specialized training and formal education, have all molded Chief Greener as a true leader who has been successful in steering the city's fire department as a service we are all proud of and willing to share across the state. the 2017 Daryl Hildebrand Regional Award of Merit for Distinguished Leadership goes to Chief Douglas R. Greener of the Bakersfield Fire Department. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. And I kind of have to say wow, too, after that video. That's pretty fantastic. Um, and I, I am actually glad to be following the Municipal bud Budgeting Award. <laughs> and not the law enforcement, so. Uh, but again, I'm Doug Greener, Bakersfield Fire Chief. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, you know, I did a little research ahead of time on Daryl Hildebrand, and uh, I know he was a dedicated member of Kern Cog and a, a very well-respected regional planner, so I'm, I'm really uh, uh, appreciative of being chosen uh, for his namesake award. Uh, you know, and, th and this is not going to be news to anybody because I know there are a lot of leaders out here in this audience, but uh, leadership is a, is a difficult proposition. Uh, so it's an honor to be recognized for distinguished leadership. Uh, you know, although I'm truly convinced that uh, whatever success we've had is more about our team effort, so I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, but I have made a few uh, observations during my tenure as fire chief um, about the most effective leadership tenets that we've used to successfully support the fire department's mission. And I've kind of boiled it down to three uh, main categories uh, that we lead under. Uh, we lead by example. Uh, you know, if you expect dedication, be dedicated. If you expect accountability, be accountable. If you expect fairness, be fair. And if you expect professionalism, be professional. There's some of our golden rules uh, the do as I say and not as I do model is an organizational morale killer, and we avoid that. Uh, all the fire department chief staff uh, lead by example and through role modeling, and it's been a successful strategy. We also are very fortunate to lead with the best people, and when you have the best people, it makes leadership a little bit easier. Uh, the BFD has the finest firefighters and support staff risking their lives every day to support the community or in support of that mission. And we have the finest uh, chief and administrative staff officers, uh, including Deputy Fire Chief Ross Kelly, who's here with his wife, Deputy Fire Chief Tyler Hartley, who's here with his wife tonight, uh, Battalion Chief John Frando, who's here with his wife as well, and who is our community services officer, uh, all leaders in their own right. Uh, BFD nonprofit groups, uh, they do uh, outstanding uh, work in this community throughout the year supporting other charitable organizations either through uh, direct contributions from our firefighters or uh, by fundraising uh, directly for those uh, organizations and, and they make us look really good as well too. And, and you know, there, you don't hear a lot of positive feedback these days about labor organizations, um, but the Bakersfield Professional Firefighters 246 is the exception. Um, 
th this group is the most professional uh, board I've ever had the pleasure of uh, sitting at the negotiation table with. Uh, I was promoted to fire chief at the, uh, at the apex of the recession. And in the almost eight years since, um, when, when the BPF members have been asked for concessions to help uh, the city continue its mission, um, they have never once said, uh, we, we can't or we won't. Um, so I, I really appreciate their sacrifice and, and their, their dedication. And I'd just like to recognize BPF President Nick Polos, who's here with his wife as well, too. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, and of course, we have, uh, you know, uh, amazing support uh, from our city manager and staff, uh, our city council, our mayor, and, and our community at large. Uh, leaders and organizations are nothing without quality followers and adequate support. The fire department's uh, blessed to have both. Um, I'd also like to thank my wife, uh, Lori, uh, who is the uh, at-home chief and leader. <laughs> Uh, for her behind the scenes support as well. I couldn't be the fire chief without her support. Uh, and finally, we lead with mission focus. Uh, you know, it's not about the leader or leadership, it's about the mission. Uh, we support those engaged in pur purposeful duty. Uh, we show the right way to get the job done and we allow good people to do good work. Uh, I didn't become the fire chief to build my res resume or showcase myself, although I feel a little bit like I've done some of that here tonight. Uh, I'm first and foremost a firefighter, uh, and I've only ever wanted to lead the finest fire department, and I've been very lucky to have had that privilege. Uh, so again, thank you, and a special thank you on behalf of the men and women of the Bakersfield Fire Department to the current Council of Governments. Thank you. Managing budgets for a living is not always a glamorous job and requires a great deal of patience, knowledge, and continued education. Imagine having to manage the budget of one of the largest counties in our state and the largest employer in our county. Lucky for the residents of Kern County, that task falls into the steady and talented hands of Nancy Lawson, Assistant County Administrative Officer, and Elsa Martinez, Chief Deputy County Administrative Officer. Together, they have managed the county's budget for the past six years and have navigated the county through its current fiscal crisis. Nancy Lawson began public service by taking a job at the Auditor Controller's Office in 1997. She became the Assistant Auditor Controller in 2009. This experience has been crucial in her current role as the Assistant CAO for Budget and Finance, which puts her in charge of the development and presentations of the county's $2.6 billion budget. Elsa Martinez began her public service career in 2000 working for the Auditor Controller. From 2005 to 2010, Elsa worked as the Administrative Services Officer for the District Attorney. Since 2010, she has been with the CAO's office as the Chief Deputy for Budget and Finance. Elsa is specifically responsible for the debt management and pension plan analysis. Nancy and Elsa came into budget management at the same time when the county was in the middle of a fiscal emergency. Although a $60 million reserve may sound like a wonderful savings for a personal budget, it's only a fraction of what is needed to cover personal, capital expenses, and revenue expenditures for a county of our size. Despite the challenging budget, both women as a team have become the budget gurus, as characterized by James Berker, guiding the CAO and the Board of Supervisors through each budget. As the budget outlook has improved, they increased the amount deposited into reserves each year, which acknowledges the need to plan for future impacts. The largest impact was the drop in oil prices, resulting in a $44.5 million decrease in oil-related property tax revenue for the County General Fund and $17.5 million for the Fire Fund during fiscal year 2016-17. In an effort to limit service level impacts to county departments, Nancy and Elsa constructed a four-year plan of phased-in reductions in the use of reserves to balance the budget. This buildup of reserves has helped the county avoid major service level impacts to the taxpayers, which include public safety, general government, health and sanitation, public assistance, and education. It is due to their vision of creating this four-year mitigation plan that the county has now cut its deficit in half in both the county general fund and fire fund. The fiscal prudence that Nancy and Elsa exhibit have navigated the county through difficult times in order to maintain county services. 
In addition to all of this, Nancy and Elsa have maintained a stable credit rating during this fiscal crisis, which in and of itself is a difficult task. Nancy was named one of the Bakersfield Californians People to Watch in 2015, and Elsa was instrumental in the transfer of Kern Medical into a hospital authority in order for it to become financially sustainable. She worked tirelessly to ensure its success and was recognized for a commitment to the task by the Kern County Hospital Authority Board of Governors back in 2016. Every year since fiscal year 2014 to 15, Nancy, Elsa, and the whole budget team have been awarded the Government Finance Officer Association's Distinguished Budget Presentation Award. This award is given to state and local governments that produce budget documents of the highest quality. In addition, each year, Nancy and Elsa both participate in the Kern Leaders Academy to provide future leaders an overview of local government finance and the impact it plays on the county taxpayers. Nancy and Elsa have garnered the respect of not only the county administrative office, but also the Board of Supervisors and county staff. They are regarded as subject matter experts in their field, as several counties and organizations seek their counsel. Both women have led the budget team and the county through tough fiscal times with their fiscal prudence, their expertise, and their leadership. It goes without saying, we are proud to present our 2017 Regional Award of Merit for the Daryl Hildebrand Distinguished Leadership Award to a public group to Nancy Lawson and Elsa Martinez of Kern County's Administration Office. Well, it's a little surreal. We weren't sure what they were going to be um, presenting. Uh, we look at this, both Elsa and I, as, uh, you know, this is our job and we love it. We feel blessed to have the job that we have. Um, we're very passionate about the county's fiscal health and uh, uh, we're glad that we're able to um, participate in, in making it uh, more stable. Um, I do have to recognize we have an amazing staff. They are brilliant and talented, and without them, that we would not uh, be able to do a lot of these amazing things that you're you're seeing. Um, we also have to, uh, or at least, want to recognize and appreciate that we have both a past CAO John Nylon and a current CAO Ryan Alsop who trust us with our ideas and our thoughts um, and let us go forward with those things. Uh, we also appreciate the board's confidence in our recommendations. Uh, they do not have easy uh, decisions to make and we realize that, um, but we're very um, blessed to do what we do. Thank you so much. Five, two. <laughs> It is a great honor to receive an award for the work I love to do. I want to thank those that do all the hard work, our county leaders, employees, under the leadership of our Board of Supervisors and our boss, uh, Ryan Elsop. Thank you. Public service is not an easy job. While some people might believe that elected office is a place where someone goes to be wined and dined by special interests, or take lavish trips funded by taxes, or to gain a small amount of celebrity, the truth is that being an elected official is most often an unglamorous and thankless role. It is a job in which someone will almost always disagree with every decision you make and will blame you for failures that you never had a hand in. But public service can be an exceptionally rewarding opportunity for the right person someone that is dedicated to their community, that can see the good in others, and that can work with a diverse group of people to support a common goal, can find sustained success in their role as an elected official. As a resident of Tehachapi for over 50 years, Phil Smith knows the ins and outs of Tehachapi. Even before moving to Tehachapi, Phil lived in the nearby town of Keene while his father worked for the railroad. When his family first moved to Tehachapi in 1960, Phil lived in an old home that was located next to the iconic Tehachapi Water Tower, mere feet from the railroad tracks. 
and might be one of the reasons Phil developed an interest in transportation infrastructure and its importance to a community. Phil graduated from Tehachapi High School and went on to serve in the United States Coast Guard before returning home to Tehachapi with his family. In 1986, he was elected to the Tehachapi City Council, transitioning his service with the armed forces and our great country into service to his hometown. As a continuous member of the Tehachapi City Council since 1986, Phil has served as mayor or mayor pro tem seven different times, most recently as mayor from 2012 to 2014. As a steady and humble leader of the community, Phil routinely serves as a moderating voice on the council and takes the time to explain complicated issues to concerned members of the public. During his 31 years on the Tehachapi City Council, he has helped lead Tehachapi through the inevitable difficulties of a growing small town. His leadership has helped lead to so many improvements in Tehachapi, which are too numerous to list. Recent highlights, however, might include the construction of Challenger Drive, leading to an important second roadway connection to the new Tehachapi Hospital. The list might also highlight the transformation of public assets like the Tehachapi Depot, the BK Theater, the Tehachapi Wastewater Treatment Plant, the Freedom Plaza and Visitor Center, the Senior Center, and the Tehachapi Police Headquarters. Phil has also served diligently with numerous other groups and agencies, most notably on the board of the Kern Council of Governments. Beginning in 1995, Phil jumped right into his service with Kern Cog by participating in the regional project prioritization process. That initial process has led to so many important regional transportation projects, one of which is the development of the State Route 58 Mojave Bypass. Through a partnership with other counties in the region, projects to widen State Route 14 and US 395 have helped to increase economic opportunity for East Kern, and the widening of State Route 46 has dramatically improved safety for motorists traveling to California's Central Coast. Phil also participated in the decision to construct the Westside Parkway through Metropolitan Bakersfield and the Centennial Corridor. These projects will significantly enhance traffic mobility for commerce and travelers heading east and west through Bakersfield. If you asked Phil, he would likely deflect any credit to himself and choose to instead recognize all the people that have helped to make Tehachapi and Kern County a great place to live and do business. In truth, however, it takes an incredible person to honestly serve the public for decades in the dedicated manner he has, which is why Phil is so deserving of this recognition. It is with, with great, great honor, honor that we present this Ronald E. Brummett Lifetime Achievement Award for to an elected, elected official to our friend, Phil Smith of Tehachapi. <laughs> I don't know what to say, my gosh. So I had to write it down, right? You know, I received a call a few weeks ago from uh, Aaron Hakimi. He said, congratulations, Mr. Smith. Uh, you've been selected for a regional award. And uh, I have to say I was really speechless, you know, because I've served as chairman of the board, along with Cheryl and <laughs> Jennifer. And I've been up here uh, dispensing awards like we've been doing this evening. And you don't even think about it as ever going to be receiving one. So it's, it's such an honor. But I'd never give it another thought. And you know, these road projects that you've been seeing, uh, they take such a long time. And uh, like 178, 58, 46, I remember going through the trials and tribulations of Route 46. We're starting to see 395 be uh, maybe completed. Route 58 most recently on the very east side of the county. If you've ever gone to Vegas or points east in the United States, there's a freeway that turns into two lanes. In here in the United States, <laughs> you know, and that's and so that's going to be completed. And I was very fortunate to be able to uh, serve with a group of uh, Inyo Mono counties, uh, Kern County, San Bernardino counties, and it was a regional effort to use monies from those counties in certain years that would help us down here in Kern County in certain years, and just the cooperations just between three or four different counties gained us a lot of. Uh, respect from Sacramento, uh, the, uh, the uh, Transportation Commission. So it's been very rewarding to be able to be just a part of that, you know, just uh, participating. Uh, these projects take a long time, 
<laughs> and I've been on here long enough, it's kind of interesting that you normally start a project when you're a board member and you vote on it and then you read about it about 20 some years later. <laughs> I got to see one finish up. <laughs> the, tri <laughs> the trip program is one of them. So anyway, that's, that's really something. Um, however, just like a lot of folks here say, you, you can't take this award and without sharing it with, some, uh, with other people. My family, Becky, my wonderful wife of 47 years, my best friend, my wonderful children, supported me in so many ways. I can't thank you enough for all the sacrifices that you've uh, made for all the years. I love you all. And uh, I share this award with all of you and all of you, everyone here, so thank you. To my fellow members and colleagues at Kern Council of Governments, uh, it's been an absolute honor to serve and work with all of you on the board at Kern Council of Governments. To the city of Tehachapi, my thanks to Tyler Napier for the nomination, and then for everyone jumping on board and, and running with it, uh, and your unending support, city council members, all of you present, raise a hand. <laughs> Thank you so much, our mayor, uh, and all over the county. Uh, we often hear the, the, the word staff. It's just a simple S-T-A-F-F, -F, and it's just, you've heard it, every award here mentions their staff, but the staff means a lot of people, individuals with their families, and things that they've had to, s to struggle with and be part of the process. So staff means more than just a word, it means a lot of people and, and who do a lot of work, f and they don't get credit for it, uh, and we have to all give each other a, a round of applause for, you, for all the staffs in the entire county. And all I can hope for with this is that uh, it's a wonderful award. I just hope I've been able to make a difference and made a difference in our city and county and that uh, for a place that we all call home. So it's very humbling and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Tom Well has a passion for aviation. His career path began in the U.S. Air Force, where he served for 26 years in aircraft maintenance. He retired as a Chief Master Sergeant, serving as aircraft maintenance supervisor for four different types of aircraft at the 412th Test Squadron, where he managed 500 men and women. During his career, he spent several years in Korea and Thailand in addition to stateside duty. After retiring from the Air Force, Tom managed the California City Airport, where he developed relationships with pilots and others from Mojave. Those relationships were enhanced during Wells' service with the Mojave Air and Spaceport, and again when he became city manager. Tom managed finances at the Mojave Airport after he was recruited by former CEO Stuart Witt. During his time at the California City Municipal and Mojave Airports, and later managing California City Government, Tom became something of an expert at obtaining government grant funds to help build infrastructure at the airports and the city. In all of his positions, Tom has kept a close eye on the budgets of the agencies he's managed and is involved with, including the Air Material Command Community Liaison Group, where the Air Force focuses on doing more with less. Tom sees his efforts in helping California City attract the medical marijuana industry to the city as one of his major achievements. Attracting the industry should put the city in a position to develop the infrastructure to attract other, more conventional businesses. That effort will help the city down the road, especially if the initial excitement of the medical marijuana business recedes over time. And Tom has also been instrumental in improving highway access between the city and Edwards Air Force Base, which will make transportation to and from a lot safer once it's completed. The 140th Street extension will build a section of road that will connect Rosamond Boulevard at the North Gate with California City Boulevard, eliminating an at-grade intersection with Highway 58 and a bad curve that was closer to the city. He has also worked to help the city be recognized by Edwards and other communities in the region, including Lancaster and Palmdale, as full community partners. As a partner in a regional renaissance that has taken place in Southeast Kern in recent years, our community leaders in the region have been working together rather than engaging in the petty infighting common in some other areas and at the national level. The effort to develop an integrated regional water management plan, ERWMP, helped spur this effort. 
Irwump encourages regions to work together to manage scarce water resources through planning that can qualify them for state funds to build infrastructure to achieve their goals. An Irwump for the Fremont Valley Basin, which serves California City and Mojave, has brought together leaders in two communities, ending years of low-level squabbling and increasing cooperation. Tom and Mojave Public Utility District General Manager B. Coy have played key roles in the effort, which continues to move forward. Involvement in the Greater Antelope Valley Economic Alliance, Antelope Valley Board of Trade, Kern Economic Development Corporation, and the East Kern Economic Alliance has helped put California City on the map and on the minds of businesses and industries looking for a new home to expand their operations. Tom has also developed and maintained great working relationships with other city managers in Kern County and elected officials throughout Kern County as well as at the national level. Tom retired from the position of city manager of California City after eight years concluding in November of 2017. He remains active in the community with the California City Host Lions Club and other organizations within the community. And we are happy that Tom calls California City his home. And once again, I'm proud to say the 2017 Veronal E. Brummett Regional Award for Lifetime Achievement of a Public Official is presented to Tom Wheel. You know, I'm just happy to say that uh, I think everybody here has, you can never achieve an award if it wasn't for the people around you. Uh, as we said before, it's the work of many that has made it success throughout the years. I've been blessed through faith, family, and friends to carry forward uh, in my work throughout East Kern and, uh, and both with the Air Force. I've had great mentors. Uh, Stu Witt uh, was one of my best ones that I can really say uh, who's doing really well. And Chief Whiting, I know you just recently retired. You saw that I, I've retired a few months a few ahead of you here. The honeydew list hasn't caught up with you yet, uh, but it will. Uh, but. Anyway, I would like to give a shout out to my wife of 43 years, uh, Heather, who is not he able to work, be here tonight because she had to work, uh, but uh, you couldn't do it without her. She built the foundation for which my success has been built upon, as well as my daughters, uh, the two daughters that I have, Hanukkah and Linda. But once again, thank you so much for my, my friends and families and all of you here that helped make uh, Kern County and East Kern a better place for all of us to live in the future. Thank you. After nearly four decades as the face of the Kern County oil industry, Les Clark is retiring. As a resident of Taft for most of his life, Les attended schools in the area until completing his education at Fresno State University with his bachelor's in education. His basic knowledge of the oil industry was obtained from part-time employment with Atlantic Richfield and Petroleum while he was attending school. Subsequently, Bell Ridge Oil Company and Shell Oil Company employed him prior to assuming his position with the Independent Oil Producers Agency, or IOPA, of the San Joaquin Valley operation. IOPA is a membership organization comprised of independent oil companies operating mainly in the San Joaquin Valley. As the leader in oil production throughout our nation, you can imagine how large IOPA's membership was. Les served as vice president from 1980 to 1999, at which time he was promoted to executive vice president. He has been responsible in this role for reviewing and analyzing all regulatory issues and advising his members of what things they need to keep an eye out for in the upcoming years. He became the principal contact with all federal, state, and San Joaquin Valley officials and staff, and his retirement brings with it an end of an era with IOPA who is also calling it a wrap and simultaneously closing its doors after 113 years of representing small oil producers. Throughout his tenure, Les has been involved in many local organizations as well as numerous county, state, and federal agency work groups. Among those are Governor Schwarzenegger's California Partnership for San Joaquin Valley, Governor Gray Davis's Central Valley Economic Task Force, Kern County Fair Board Member, Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, and Groundwater Protection Council just to name a few. Throughout his 40 years of work, Les has participated in more than 60 of these agencies and committees in an effort to be a local voice at the state and national level for the small oil producers of our county. And Les has been recognized with numerous other awards for his hard work and dedication to his community. 
He has been recognized by the Kern County Hispanic Chamber as Businessman of the Year and received the Association of California School Administrators Golden Apple Award. He is a Hall of Fame member for not only Taft Union High School, but for Kern County Officials Association and Westside Little League. And these are just a few of Les's recognitions for his commitment to his community. But no one is able to give so much to their profession and the community where they live without the support of a wonderful family. Les has been married to June for 51 years, and together they have raised two beautiful daughters, Tessa and Carrie, along with one son, Les III, who is just as committed to his community as his father. Les and June's family does not stop there. They also have 10 grandchildren and one great granddaughter. Their lives are full, and regardless of Les's retirement, we are sure we'll see him at his grandchildren's activities and community events throughout Kern County. Current Council of Governments congratulates Les Clark and is happy to present him with the 2017 Ronald E. Brummett Regional Award of Merit for Lifetime Achievement to a Private Citizen. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, anytime you get an award, it's special. And this one is really special to me. Uh, been, you know, citizen of the year. My wife might not agree with that when I, <laughs> when, when I keep forgetting to take out that blue trash, but I, I don't know what that's about. I, can't, I think I'm colorblind, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so we, yeah, we've been married 52 years. I've got to tell you a story about me, you know, why I can't get up these steps. Uh, about a month and a half ago, I got out of the shower, and when you're 75, and uh, you do the splits. I couldn't even do the splits when I was in the best shape of football. <laughs> I'm looking back, this one leg's back here and the other one's up here. I go, this is, my wife was yelling at me. She said, I can't get you up. I said, I, she said, there's some guys out there working on a water line for the county. I'm gonna go get them. I said, we don't need any hydrocrane here. Just, <laughs> you just settle down. But anyway, we made it back. I tell you, I, I, you know, I'm real happy with this award. I really am. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of people here from the West Side Taft out there. I thought they all come over to see me. I forgot the Chief's getting the award. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Chief. I, I appreciate you bringing along some folks. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much. And I know a lot of you in here. The awards named after Ron Brahman. Him and I used to work on some issues together back in the day. That's when I had more hair and didn't weigh quite as much. And I think Ron still had a bushy mustache. That was the ugliest mustache I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. But anyway, uh, it's really a pleasure to receive the Ron Brahman Award. He's a good guy. Uh, I appreciated the work and the time of, that we, we spent together. And to all you award winners, especially you folks that are out there keeping us safe, I really appreciate you. I really do. Thanks for the award. This brings us to the end of our program. Before we leave, we would like to recognize one more individual who stepped in to fill some pretty big shoes. Thank you so much to Bruce Jones, Tammy's husband, for being our new voice for the regional awards. Bruce was unable to join us tonight because he took ill, but he did a fantastic job. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.